And so we're in it. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, and then we will, and then we'll see what happens. So we've got, we got about 30 people in here and I'm expecting a few more to trickle in, but as long as they hear you talking, it's good. <laughs> All right, so hi everybody um, and welcome to our session. Of course, this is like the first round session. Um, so, um, you know, no pressure to uh, make this the best one that you see all day, but I think we've got about 40 minutes or so uh, where we're gonna be hanging in here today, learning um, from the Loyola, Loyola Marymount University and Nicola, um, who's gonna share some of, their, um, some of their tactics and the ways that they've been kind of moving into their Salesforce practice and institutional capacity. I know I'm really interested from this session, because we're kind of building out like the same thing or trying to build out the same thing at Smith. So I know I will have questions, but just a reminder as uh, we're presenting here, what we'd like you guys to do is post any questions that you'd like us to consider for Q&A at the very end under the Q&A tab. Um, and of course, I'm sure that we will use chat and the confetti and all the good things uh, that come with our session. Um, so with that, I'm actually gonna hand off and, um, and if you wanna go to the next screen, we'll let you just kind of introduce yourself and your title um, using your baseball card. Thanks so much. Uh, mm -hmm. Hi, guys. Thanks so much for joining today. Uh, hopefully this session description was interesting to you. Uh, so my name is Nicola Monet Jacobs. I'm the director of enterprise applications at Loyola Marymount University. That means I'm in the IT group at LMU, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, right now, we are in the process of implementing two uh, new Salesforce orgs. Um, and, and as the title suggested, we basically went from nothing to this. So uh, that's a unique proposition. But if you are in the same boat, then hopefully some of this information will be interesting to you. Um, you can read a little bit here about some of the things that we're addressing both on the student success side and the university advancement side, some of the technologies that we're leveraging to make that happen. We're a banner school. We use Slate for admissions. Those things are sort of off the table and, 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 and part of our ecosystem. We also use Talon for our data integration, which is not MuleSoft, which is sort of interesting, um, and some of the other technologies that you see there. So if, it goes without saying, but I'll say it. If you have any questions about anything we talk about today, we only have so much time, but you're more than welcome to reach out to me. I'm happy to talk about any of this more in depth. Pretty much every single slide in this presentation could be a whole presentation in and of itself. So if you see anything in here that's interesting and you want to know more, um, you know, just you're more than welcome to hit me up. I'm happy to speak about it. Um, so uh, who is LMU, Loyola Marymount University? So, you know, for those of you who had a chance to visit our beautiful main campus, which you see a little picture of there, we're based in Los Angeles, California. Uh, the institution was founded in 1911. So like we've been around for more than 100 years. Um, our mission is really important to us. It is not just something that we pay lip service to. Um, it's about the encouragement of learning, the education of the whole person, and the service of faith and the promotion of justice. And so that is imbued in things like our strategic plan and everything that we do here. So you hear more about that. We have seven schools and colleges, over three campuses total. That's our main campus. But we also have a Playa Vista campus around the corner for our School of Film and Television, as well as our downtown law school campus. In total, we've got about just over 10,000 students, inclusive of undergraduate, graduate law school, everybody. But we have a student to faculty ratio of 11 to 1. So that's what's on our public website right now. So that's really important to us, that kind of high touch. And so uh, you'll hear a little bit more about that in the presentation. I am super happy to share that as of like literally last week, we are now officially a Hispanic serving institution as well as an Ama Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institution. So being an HSI is something that we have been very, very close to accomplishing um, and that we finally accomplished that goal. And so that's really exciting to us and is, is part of some of the student success work that we'll talk about today. So let's talk a little bit about the before times, right? You know, I said in my description for the session that we went from zero to Salesforce, and that was absolutely true. So the before times, we're talking mostly pre-2020, right? So obviously pre-COVID, although that's not necessarily super relevant, but we had some investment in CRM technologies that were not Salesforce. Um, we had a small case management implementation for what we called our community of care. This was a referral program for students in crisis. It was a very small targeted implementation, but it had a lot of potential. Um, we, Like I said, we had essentially no Salesforce footprint, um, but we had the way that people were getting the information that they needed to support student success was a lot of data integrations and reports. So if you needed information like reports, spreadsheets, you would go to the office of the registrar, they generate them for you. 
Um, but we, we had a lot of technology on campus and we still do, but it was mostly a, a result of targeted sort of niche system implementations for, for different specific groups, right? Um, and then we would do our due diligence as an IT organization and bring in whatever data that they said they wanted according to whatever terms and definitions they thought were important to their context, these particular departments. So it was not sort of um, a coherent um, sort of data space as it were. These are siloed systems. We had immature data governance. If you wanted data, you had to get the data steward or the data owner to sign off. But then once you asked for what you wanted and if they said yes, then you got it. And then that was kind of the end of the story. Um, one of the things that uh, I'll talk about in a second is, is in many ways, we had a lot of executive partnership across campus where technology was really seen as an enabler and a force multiplier. But specifically in the areas of student success and university advancement in this before time period, technology was, this is, these are one of the few areas where technology was not really understood to be a force multiplier. Um, and, and so that was sort of, we were sort of swimming upstream in terms of helping to help people understand that aspect, which we'll talk about more in a second. One of the things that's really important to note then and now is that we have a strong commitment to faculty advising. That low student faculty ratio is really important to us. And so the hallmark of advising as it is officially known really relates back to that student to faculty relationship. And that's really important. We wanna bolster that, we wanna support that. That's always gonna be true. Uh, but as we all know, and anybody who's worked in the student success space, there's a lot of other stuff that has to ring around that relationship and, and that advising related to sort of logistical barriers, paperwork, operational things that students have to do to retain and to graduate, right? And so there wasn't really a ton of centralized coordination of that student support. Um, we had, we have, and we had a very high retention rate. Our retention rate, our first to second year retention rate for undergrads is around 90%. Kind of goes up and down, but sort of circles around that number. That is a retention rate that a lot of institutions would kill for. But for us, it was sort of stubborn. We were sort of magnetized to that number and we weren't getting any traction of moving it beyond that. So, um, and the coordination that was happening uh, amongst departments like financial aid, bursar, dean of students, you know, athletics for student athletes, like all these programs, it was very highly dependent upon personal relationships, right? So like, if you think back to the keynote this morning with Carrie, you know, we had these thick line boundaries, but that boundary spanning that she was talking about was happening based on personal relationships. Like a person would pick up the phone and call another person. And because they had a high trust relationship um, where there was a lot of kindredness and like um, high trust and they were willing to share information, they could do it on a point to point basis. But as we all know, that really doesn't scale past a certain point, right? And there was really no single pane of glass. Everybody had their own siloed systems that were showing them what they wanted to see in their particular lens on it. But when they were making these connections across boundaries, weren't necessarily speaking the same language because everybody had a different lens on it, right? So this, if this sounds familiar to you, then you are in the same boat as we were, right? And to a certain extent are and are working to address. So uh, it's worth taking a step back and talking about the role of IT at LMU. We are lucky, I guess you could say in some ways, in that we have a highly centralized IT function on our campus. Because of the size of the institution we are and the work that my predecessors and my prior leadership has done, we have strong partnerships and relationships across campus. And our university policy dictates that you can't buy any technology without going through us. And that doesn't mean just buying computers. It also means SaaS agreements and things like that. That's a privileged position to be in. And I recognize that. Um, but we also have well-established processes around technology projects and investments. So we have governance around that. That's the infrastructure that I inherited when I joined LMU 10 years ago. That's a very privileged position to be in. But if you do not have that, a lot of things we're gonna talk about today, you can still use. You will just have to do it with intention, right? What we know from these uh, pre-existing relationships and these pre-existing governance and processes that successful technology projects require strong business sponsorship. And, and I don't know if business is the right word, it's the word that we use. But when I talk about business, I'm talking about Everybody who's not IT, I guess, right? We see IT as a service function to the campus. We're helping other people do their jobs, right? With technology, augmented with technology. And so, you know, I'm, when I talk about the business, it's 
academic affairs, it's student affairs, it's faculty, it's departments, right? Um, it's all those folks and how we support them. And so anything that we do is going to, from the get-go, from day zero, from minus day minus one, is going to require that partnership first, right? So we already had that. And so that provided the basis for what we did next. But you can also take those lessons and establish that and do a lot of the same things, even if you don't have those those things in place, right? So around about 2020, 2019, 2020, you know, I, although, you know, we're very aligned with the business and we're, they are kind of driving the requests, at least sort of officially, we're in a privileged position as a, as a centralized unit to be able to observe some broad trends kind of across the spectrum, right? And we know because we're keeping tabs on what's going on in technology and we see the, the promise of technology. We wouldn't do this work if we didn't think technology could make things better. We saw some things, right? Obviously, during this period, you know, we're having our COVID response and then we're figuring out what a post-COVID, and I should have put quote marks around that, normaliz normalization, again, quote marks, even looks like. So that's all happening. But we, we can't only focus on that. We know and we've been following and we know that CRM technologies have a lot of potential to help better coordinate information and response across the university and bust down those silos, just like you heard about in the keynote this morning. We knew that the relationship-based approach was kind of, it wasn't scalable, right? And, and, and how could we make that more efficient so that those folks could focus on doing other stuff? Um, the manual approach didn't scale. We also did have, there was a bit of a sea change happening, right? So whereas before we had leaders who had been at the institution a long time and they didn't really get the value that these technologies could bring because they had worked for decades at the institution without them. And they were like, well, everything's going great. What's the problem, right? But stuff started to change sort of 2020, 2021, where we were getting some turnover, right? There was a lot of reorienting of positions. We're getting new, new leaders on campus, both at the executive level and also at the middle management tier, right? And these folks are coming in from other institutions where they already have systems like this at their campus. And they're like, how do you guys not have this, right? And so that was helpful. Um, and then people were asking us, they were banging down our door and saying, can I have Salesforce? Can I have some Salesforce? I would like some Salesforce, please. And we we're like, whoa, 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 because we were in the position of not having, you know, I think a lot of institutions find themselves in a situation where there's like 75 orgs and they have no way to kind of rein it in. We were lucky. We didn't have that right yet. And so we're like, OK, well, we don't want that. So how can we give people what they need? Because that's our job, but also do it in a controlled way or have some kind of vision or strategy around this. So the other thing that happened on the other side, a lot of this is about student success, but there's also this advancement component, too. We got a new senior vice president on the advancement side. Prior to this, our leadership on the advancement side was kind of in sort of a set it and forget it technology mode, right? They didn't really see how technology was really going to be a force multiplier for their efforts, incredibly. And so we're like, okay, hey, well, you could lead a horse to water. You can't make him drink. We'll put our energy somewhere else until you guys are ready to really want to do something here. Well, that all changed when they got a new SVP and they were like, wow, we need a complete new technology roadmap for university advancement, right? We had legacy solutions that were reaching their end of life. Um, and, and it was clear to everybody at, with a new assessment that sort of a longstanding underinvestment in technology to support university advancement needed to be addressed. So this is like all stuff that's like percolating, right? So then another thing that happened was the, the university decided to do a strategic plan, right? And so in 2020, they started pulling together these campus teams to inform that strategic plan. One of those campus teams was a team on student success and student resiliency. Because of the partnership that IT had had across campus, we had strong representation in these campus teams. Um, and so we already knew kind of what we wanted to do. And I'm going to talk about it. Maybe I should have switched the order of these slides, but there's an, a slide that's coming up next. They'll speak a little bit more to some of the groundwork we were already laying by this point. And so the timing just worked out really, really well. And we were like, hey, you know, you're talking about student success, which we had really never effectively talked about at the university before. And you're talking about student resiliency, especially in light of COVID. You know, there's an opportunity here. And so we were able to work with our campus partners to effectively incept this into the strategic plan. And so you can go to the URL there and you can look at the strategic plan, it's, it's public. Um, and you can see that this strategic plan included five spotlight initiatives. That's the blue that you see there. And one of those spotlight initiatives was something that ended up being called personalized connections. This was about student success. It was about student connection to the institution. 
Um, and it was about, you know, better outcomes for students. And so one of the specific tasks that's explicitly called out in the, in the um, strategic plan is to create this centralized, coordinated student success infrastructure that includes what we called a web of support technology foundation. You'll see the word advising is not in here because that is faculty do advising. That's not what this is about. This is about this ring of support, this web of support that surrounds students that had always been there but we wanted to formalize it. We wanted to call it out. We wanted to better support it with technology and also organizational infrastructure to make it more robust, right? We are lucky because this is the only specific technology that's called out in the strategic plan. Now, to be clear, there's no automatic money fountain that gets turned on when something gets put into a strategic plan, not at my institution and probably not at your institution either. However, when you do go to get that money, you can say, hey, remember that strategic plan? It, this is in there. This is specifically called out in there, right? So we're starting to lay the dominoes, right? What's happening, as I referenced earlier, alongside of this strategic planning effort was, and I alluded to this earlier, people are coming to us and starting to ask for this technology, right? We have, as I alluded to earlier, a, a fairly robust um, uh, a technology governance process, which we're lucky to have. And so through that process, we got multiple requests in the same cycle for CRM technologies. And so we kind of laid them out to our governance committee, which is our university technology council. And we said, look, hey guys, we didn't even have to say anything. I was there. We just kind of laid all the business cases out and we're like, what do you see here? And everybody's like, well, these are the same thing. And we're like, yes. So um, the, the council was, real, it was like, look, we could build these individual things or we could try to take a stab at doing something more holistic, which we have really not co comprehensively done before. But but the evidence was there that the demand was there. Right. So the council was like, eh, we want more data. So we went and we did a report. And so what I want to call out here is in that report, we went to white papers. Salesforce does some great ones. Forrester in partnership with Forrester. We went to the Educaz core data service. In 2019, the Educause Core Data Service did a student success specific questionnaire, which they have never repeated. But the timing was great for us. I, I wish that they would revive it because it's really helpful. But whatever data you can mine from whatever sources you can get, maybe you're part of a consortium like we are where you can mine some data from that. That was data that we could present to our executives, right? What influenced them to kind of give us the green light to go down this road was data from peer institutions, there was also an emphasis on data security, right? Because those spreadsheets that I mentioned before, those are all getting sent via email and passed around and everybody knows that that's not a good idea, right? So we really hammered sort of the security um, posture of having this in the central place, right? Rather than flying these spreadsheets flying around. And we also made a recommendation to do a formal RFP, uh, which also was us laying out our criteria. We did that via committee. We laid out our criteria for what we were trying to do, right? And then we went back to our governance council with a more robust project request. So that was all happening at the same time that the strategic planning process was happening. So talking more about investments, and again, this could be a whole presentation in and of itself. I'm trying to be sensitive to time here so we can <laughs> save some time for questions. So we had an existing governance model and reputation that allowed us to fold all these CM requests into a larger effort. You may not have that but you basically need to do the same thing, right? You need to cultivate your business stakeholders who are gonna to come to the table and say, I have a strategic need for this, right? And I'm willing to throw my hat in the ring with a bunch of other people. So you need to create those connections. You need to figure out what information is gonna influence the executives that hold the purse strings, or at least can give you the green light to explore it more, right? Until you want more data that they would want to see. You're gonna to need to plan for all different kinds of money, right? So you're gonna need operating money for your licenses. You're gonna need capital money for your partner implementation. You might need staff lines, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second to help support this environment. Because remember, we had nothing. Um, uh, and, and again, the partner and vendor engagements, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it as well. So at our institution and the way our organization was structured, IT was best poised to, to be this, the place where efficiencies for a centralized solution could be coordinated, right? We've got these two different efforts, two different areas of investment when it comes to CRM technology. We have the student success side and the university advancement side. By supporting those that all out of the IT function, we could kind of 
realize um, a synergy and or the hope was that we could realize a synergy and an efficiency by supporting both of those implementations out of the IT department. I'm going to talk more about that in a second. The jury's still out on whether or not that was the best idea or not, but we shall see. Um, but we also, and I'll talk more about the efficiencies that we realized, but like IT has coordinated a lot of this in partnership with the business because we were in a position to do so, right? You know, if you have a decentralized IT model at your institution, you're going to need to figure out a different way to do it. Maybe it's about collaborating with the various decentralized IT offices and coming together with a centralized plan. Or maybe you're not in IT and maybe it's about making that partnership with IT so you guys can work together on this. Um, I talked a lot about student success and I'm, I mentioned this earlier, but while this was all going on, the University Advancement Office invested in sort of a, an assessment and a new technology roadmap. And what they realized was is they were going to need to do a complete CRM implementation, um, and it was, which may also evolve into a replacement for other ancillary technologies that they had bolted on to their sort of like legacy, not even a CRM, but donor database, let's shall we say. Um, so, like I said, there was an opportunity for some technical alignment and shared resources, not just in the support team, but, you know, for example, we have one marketing cloud environment that's shared between the two orgs. Um, we use GearSet for our DevOps and we leverage that across the two orgs. And we have an IT group that is skilled in that and can deploy to either environment. Um, we also were able to negotiate with Salesforce and use those two org investments and do bundled licensing deals that save us money. So that those are the uh, opportunities that were managed by IT that created efficiencies. So just to tell you where we are now today, on the top, we've got all of our sort of student success investments and what we're working on right now. Our student success um, implementation of Salesforce's branded Lion Connect, because Lion's our mascot. Um, so we we actually went live with Lion Connect with just the student facing component uh, in August at the beginning of the fall semester. And so that there was a lot of stuff that went live at that time to be ready for the beginning of the semester. And then as the school year is progressing, we are in the process of rolling out additional functionality. A lot of this is all about the way we're envisioning student success and how this organization, this org is going to support our student success activities is better surfacing and directing students to what they need to do when these little events crop up. So like throughout the academic calendar year, Something may happen or may not happen that's going to present potentially a roadblock to the student progressing in their journey at, at the institution. So if they've missed registration, they're under registered, uh, they're under enrolled, they got academic probation, they have a midterm deficiency, um, they forgot to apply for graduation or they need to apply for graduation or they need to get ready for registration or they've got a hold coming hold that's going to prevent them from being able to register. Like all that stuff was happening in Banner, but students were not necessarily knowing about it. And they didn't know what to do when it happened. And so what we've implemented is going to help them know about that sooner. It's going to meet them where they're at with text messaging. It's going to guide them through what they need to do to meet with an advisor to resolve the issue. And we're going to be able to, we already are allowing the advisor to take notes, the student success support team, shall I say, to take notes and put that into the student's record so there's more continuity of that support. That's all happening. Meanwhile, we're working on our implementation of Salesforce and FinQuest Advancement RM so that they can go live with their first phase of a prospect first implementation roughly in January. So it's a lot going on, um, but that's we're, we're very much in the thick of it. So if you have any questions about any of that, um, don't hesitate to reach out. So when we talk about building the team to support this, this is a team housed entirely within IT, the reports to me, right? So when we started this, the vision was is that the team could support both these efforts. We had hoped that they would not be happening concurrently like they are, but the wheels of the institution move at the rate that they move, and so it is what it is. And so when we first put this together, we created a new manager position that reports to me. We had two positions, one analyst, one developer, that we were basically able to repurpose. Same people, same job description, but just now they're their job is to learn Salesforce and get ramped up on Salesforce, right? And then we were able to repurpose through attrition um, and layoffs to other positions um, and, and make them, add them to the team. So it's like a five person team, right? That's how we started. Where we're at right now, given everything that you just saw, this is the size of the team right now. So we had to bring on board a dedicated project manager, who's great. We augmented the team with two additional 
uh, well, three additional contractor resources. So another analyst, another developer, and we just brought on board a marketing cloud specialist because marketing cloud is really important to the student success efforts that we're doing. Those contractor resources are not permanent. We do not have the funding yet to make them permanent. We'd like to make them permanent, but that's another battle for another day. But I think it's important to show this because depending on how you're triangulating the investment that you're going to be making, you need to start planning for these kinds of resources as well. You know, maybe you have folks across the institution who can do this work. Maybe you don't, right? Maybe you're like us and you're starting from scratch. The good news is, is that we started here and we grew to here, but even starting here with these five resources, you know, when we started, nobody knew Salesforce or anything about it, right? And within the space of a year, we've got a robust Salesforce team. It is possible to do, right? The trailhead resources and what Salesforce makes available is incredible, right? It is possible to learn it. But you got to also make sure to invest in making sure your business analysis is strong because you're going to need that either way. If you're going to be working in an agile process, which you probably will, you need to make sure you understand how to do that. And there's going to be a change management component, which, again, we don't have time to get into this presentation today, but I'll allude to it a little bit, but that's also been a big, because as you saw earlier, we're doing a lot of stuff and it has broad campus impact. And we need to partner with our business to understand how we roll out that change to the campus. I didn't have a chance to include it here, but one of the things that we looked at when we were trying to figure out the staffing plan is, you know, how many people do we need to support this thing? And this thing is going to be different for every campus. So it's a hard question to answer. Gartner has like a, a cool document, which I wanted to include in of time, where it says like, depending on the size and how you grow your Salesforce implementation, here's an organic way to grow the team that supports it. If you want that, I'll find it and share it with you. But that was the basis for how we set up the team originally, right? And it talks about when you need to have dedicated resources, what point you reach where you're gonna need to have that. Oh my gosh, five minute warning. Okay, so I'm gonna try to go faster. Sorry, you're good, we actually have 10 minutes. But five 10 minutes. minutes. Okay, I'm still going to try to go to go You're through this. Great. Quick. It's amazing. Okay, so setting expectations, right? Um, we were really moving from a model where people were asking for resources, we go find some commercial off the shelf software, we'd implement it and be like, the vendor would implement it for us. And we'd be like, okay, you're done, right? Um, this is not that, right? We are now shifting to a model where we're effectively building this um, for them. And so that's a really, really fundamental switch in how we work with our business users, right? Um, so there's a lot of trade-offs in that, that they understand, right? You buy something off the shelf, it is what it is, right? You accept it with its flaws and it's the good things and the bad, and you take the bad with the good. With the platform solution, you can make it, people say, can Salesforce do this? Can Salesforce? I'm like, guys, Salesforce can do whatever you want, right? It's about the iron triangle, you know, time, scope, cost, money, all those things. So that's something that you need to educate your campus partners to say like, look, we've got to work together to roadmap this out. We can make it do anything, but what do you really need it to do? Um, you've got to invest in the cross-functional team, right? Not just about educating them about how this is going to work. Take them with you to conferences, share with them events like this so that they can kind of see a little bit of how the other side works. So they understand what other institutions are doing and what's possible. Um, they are going, their priorities are going to shift because that business is responding to the broader campus needs. What's important yesterday is going to be different than what's important tomorrow, right? Some exec is going to come in and blow them out of the water and tell them to do something else. So you've got to have that strong fundamental partnership to scan down the road and say, you know, we cannot change our priorities every five seconds. We're not going to be able to like develop anything for you guys if you guys are constantly shifting what you want. So we've got to be able to work together to commit to a roadmap, right? That doesn't mean there's no flexibility, but you guys need to understand the impacts of, of, of switching gears if you need to, right? We can do it, but there's going to be impacts. And then also be intentional about what promises you make regarding efficiencies or sort of the metrics that you promise. You know, I think there was a real temptation when we came out of the gate with the student success um, project to say, oh, we're, we're going to move the needle on retention. Now it's 90, it's going to be 91, it's going to be 92. And we're like, whoa, 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 we cannot promise that, right? But there are other things we can promise, right? Um, and so that's where we set our watermark, right? And so we were very intentional about setting those expectations with the executives from day zero. Um, So our ongoing governance, what does it look like? We still have our University Technology Council, all the big projects go there. We have a more robust data governance um, committee now than we had before. And so I wanna roll, roll them in more here. 
we, we recently launched a student success technology working group because now that this thing is out of the gate and people are experiencing it, those folks who are coming to us and requesting things, oh, those voices have only gotten more louder and more anxious. And we've been able to kind of like hold them off a bit, but we need more governance around planning that roadmap. We need more transparency around planning that roadmap. And so that's something that that group is going to help to do before it goes to the, to the University Technology Council to ask for money or what have you. Um, we need our ongoing executive sponsorship. You know, we sometimes think about projects, right? And then when the project is over, the sponsorship ends. Nope, this is the sponsorship that's going to continue. I talked with one of our sponsors once where she said to me, you know, Nicola, I feel like this is never going to be done. Um, and I was like, no, it won't be done. But guess what? That's not a bad thing. This is our legacy. The legacy that you and I are giving this campus is the organizational infrastructure that you are building and the technology that we are deploying to support that, that's our legacy, right? It's always going to evolve. It's never going to stop. But the, to go from nothing to that, that's a legacy that we can be proud of. One of the other challenges we're having right now is, again, some of this is just going to be scattershot, but how do we handle different sizes of work, right? So some things are small, uh, some things are low-hanging fruit, some things are like medium, and some things are bigger projects. And we have to decide, still we haven't worked this out exactly, although we're trying to think about it right now, what can we just handle and what needs to go through governance, right? And to what level of governance? That's something we're still figuring out. So uh, again, I don't have time, but thoughts about managing partners. Again, that could be a whole presentation in and of itself. Um, and I don't have time to go into this, but you can um, look at this at your leisure. Um, I would say the number one things I would pick out of what's on this list is utilize your Salesforce rep, um, have proactive communication with them, meet with them regularly, right? They are your help to holding partners accountable, but also to getting what you need, right? If they know what you need, they're going to be in a position to help you with that. I would also emphasize that whatever is in your SOW with whatever partner you sign with to do any kind of implementation, that is going to rule the roost. Be very intentional about negotiating that statement of work. Whatever is in there is what is going to hold true. So no handshakes don't matter. Conversations don't matter. It's what's in the SOW. Um, and then I have a whole bunch more lessons learned, but I ran out of time. But it's just a lot of things that I've already been talking about, right? So um, I, I didn't have enough time to get into change management more. We did do pro side change management training, um, and that was helpful. But we also ended up in IT hiring a dedicated change manager just for the department overall, and that was helpful as well. Um, be prepared to sustain a multi-year effort um, and make sure you have the executive support to do that. Be prepared to leverage and get creative about how you leverage funding mechanisms. Um, if you can grow your investment incrementally, that is ideal. Um, and you're gonna have to be willing to talk with your execs about this in an ongoing way because you're gonna need their support in an ongoing way. Um, and make sure you've got all your players at the table as early as possible um, and they're bought into the vision as early as possible. So I think all of this will be available to you guys. So if you go through these bullets in a more um, thorough way or you have specific things that I briefly mentioned here that you wanna talk more about, you can always reach out to me and I'm, I'm happy to talk more about any of this. You weren't kidding when you said each one of those slides could be their own session. Like you just gave a master class. <laughs> I'm like, I'm in awe of you. Oh my gosh. And I also, I don't, I don't think people realize how much work goes into this kind of stuff. So like, I'm going to ask you a question and then I'll go to one that's in the chat, but how much time would you say you spend on a weekly basis on some of those sort of governance activities at the moment? Yeah. I mean, I think it's kind of funny because I think for team members, they often wonder like, what do people in leadership roles do when it comes to big projects like this? And mm -hmm. I think this gives you a little bit of a sense, but like, I mean, it varies depending on where we are in the project. Some weeks it has been like 60% of my week was just talking to people and trying to address issues as they came up. Yeah. Some weeks are less, right? Um, when we're more sort of just heads down, churning out what we've committed to. But yeah, it's, it's, it is a lot of work the team is obviously fully dedicated to it, but from a leadership perspective, it's a lot of work. And I would also say that I lean really heavily on my CIO. She's very invested as a co-sponsor and she helps me a lot in terms of managing the relationship with 
you know, she's keeping our provost up to date about what we're doing about all of this. She's working with our SVP of advancement. So it's not just me, right? It's yeah. a partnership with me and her to, to do this outreach and to keep everybody up to date and on the same page. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say it goes anywhere from 10 hours a week to like 30 hours a week, depending on where we are in the project. It's definitely one of the biggest things that I'm involved with right now for the past year. I mean, it's amazing. And it sounds like you have a really great relationship with the leadership and the people specifically as stakeholders in, in this. That's amazing. I think I might be able to combine two of the other questions together. If, if you would be willing to go back to that slide that had your like current state of like your um, of your staff. Uh, I think it was the I think it was staff the staff one. Yeah. And it had like the cute little. There, um, yeah. one. there were two questions. So I'm going to ask them both and then have you answer. And I think that that'll be the time that we have. You actually answered two of the other questions during your session. No big deal. Um, <laughs> so they're wondering uh, if there were developers on your team. Um, are the developers on your team admins as well? And were the staff listed admins or analysts specifically trying to figure out who's doing that primary business analysis work? Yeah. So, I mean, we, so we have to work with the titles that HR gives us. Right. Um, and so when we're talking about analysts, we're talking about people who are more administratively oriented, right. But also doing business analysis. So like, if you want to see a job description, I can show you guys a job description if you want one, uh, happy to do that. But like the, an, what, what, what we've got here is marked analyst is sort of business analyst, Salesforce administrator, right. Um, and so there, the goal is anybody can do anything, as it were, but they're focusing more on working with the business users, uh, refining those requirements, helping making sure that the things are being tested and everything's working the way it is, troubleshooting, things like that, doing administrative work. The developers are also doing administrative work, right, too. They're not off the hook either. And they're working really closely with the analysts. They are not back in some back shady back room where they could turn the lights <laughs> off. Like they are in all the meetings with the business users too, right? They have to have those skill sets as well, right? They need to be able to jump in and look at those requirements and ask questions and be really engaged and understand the business um, business requirements as well. But that's it's typically breaking down along those lines. Yes, I'm glad they're not all in a shady back room. <laughs> no, you, don't, you don't get away with that. Uh, well, so um, thank you so much. With with that, we at, are at an end, but I would love to see if maybe there's a way for us to bring you back for a webinar or something in the future. I, I literally think you could have done an entire conference and we <laughs> felt like I, you're amazing. So thank you so much for sharing all that with us. I know I'm going to follow up with you. Um, a couple people were asking about the links to share some things. So I'll follow up to get those from you and we'll mm -hmm. post those along with the YouTube recording uh, in about 48 hours or so. Um, so I'll follow up with you. You don't worry about remembering. I'll remember for us. Um, to everybody that's in the session, thank you for hanging out with us. Um, we are going to be going into our next sponsor showcase. Um, so actually, if, if you'll go to that very last slide, um, you might remember that this is um, the way that you would get there is you're actually going to navigate to the sessions logo and then back to that main schedule. We'll be starting the five and five uh, session soon with our sponsors. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. You did so great. Oh, my gosh. You're amazing. <laughs> Thank you for all the facilitation that you guys have of put course. into this. It's incredible. Of course. Sorry about our snafu at the beginning, but it was like, it didn't even matter. You did amazing. I, I really would love to do a webinar with you, though. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Time to in like January. Um, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay. We're going to be best friends. So I'll see you on the other session. Sound good? Yep. Definitely. Talk to you guys Bye. Bye, everybody.